now we have the panel session. So with that, can I welcome Amit up? So you can do the introductions. You're the co-founder of Praxis, the biggest comms event in India. Reputation today as well, a host of other jobs. But now your big job is to manage the panelists. So I'm not brave enough for that, you are. But we have four communication leaders who have flown from three different metros of India. Before I introduce them and welcome to the stage, a quick setting the context for why this panel at an MNR conference. So Alex and I have been in touch for the last one year and when he mentioned that this conference will take place in Bahrain and how India could collaborate with the Middle East, we spoke of creating a panel where Indian communication leaders could come here and share some learnings from how they manage communications for Indian companies. So, uh, I do three things back in India. I run a social enterprise for communications where we have a training center in Mumbai that trains young graduates to become PR professionals. In addition to that, we also train various corporates and PR firm employees in various aspects of public relations and communications from time to time. The second thing I do with a team of four other people is I run a print magazine for public relations called Reputation Today. Some of you would have got some copies. I have a few left with me. You can pick them up after this session ends from the table there. The third thing I do, which is the most fascinating, is six years back, on a whim, I used to work at Edelman in Chicago and went to a few beautiful conferences in the United States for communication professionals. So one evening, I just put out a tweet on a whim saying, we in India don't have a PR conference and need to have one. Within 24 hours, about five people liked that tweet. Back then, few would like the tweet. And a few volunteered by raising their hands saying, if you do a conference in India, we'd love to support it and be part of it. Six months later, we really put together the first completely crowdsourced and crowdfunded conference without an association, without a media publication owning it. And today, in 2019, we look back at seven editions that have happened in seven different cities in India, with each conference having a unique set of 25 speakers. We've never repeated a single speaker in any of our seven conferences. We've had global CEOs, global mm -hmm. corporate leaders come to that conference. The eighth edition will happen in a beautiful town called Goa, it's also a state, on the last weekend of September this year. So for those of you in the room, we warmly welcome you. You can be in touch with me to find a way to come and spend two and a half days in India at the end of September learning from various global and Indian leaders in communications. Moving back to getting these four amazing people on stage, we have with us Rachana Panda. Rachana Panda is the Chief Communications Officer and the Head of Citizenship for GE in South Asia. Rachana is based in Gurgaon and has close to two decades of experience in public relations, corporate communications, mostly in-house. I welcome Rachana to stage. Next up, we have Sunita Venugopal. Sunita also brings with her two decades of experience in communications and public relations. She currently heads communications for Walmart Labs in India. Sunita is based in Bangalore. Welcome, Sunita. <laughs> to join these two, and then the third woman on stage, we have a gentleman called Sujit Patil. Sujit is based in Mumbai and heads global comms for a conglomerate called Godridge Group, which is in diversified businesses with multiple brands from B2C to B2B in, in India and multiple countries across the world. Uh, welcome, Sujit Patel. We have one of the youngest marketing communication leaders in India, Shreya Krishnan, who will join us on stage to moderate this panel. Shreya is the VP Marketing and Communications for an insurance broking firm called Anviti in India and wears multiple hats in various spheres in communications and outside of communications as well. Welcome, Shreya, and over to you. Quick exercise to get you on your feet. So how many of you have heard or know Bollywood songs? Hands up. Yeah, so you know the tumkas that they do, the Indian heroines in their saris? So why don't you put your right hand on your right hip, turn a little to your side, okay? And drop, and drop, and drop, and drop. So that's a tumka. So the next time you hear a Bollywood song playing, just do that. And one more thing, today is a world hug day, so just find somebody next to you and just give them a hug. I don't know if you know it was trending today, so find somebody and give them a hug. Yeah, they... <laughs> okay, so without further ado, getting to what I'm supposed to be doing here on stage with these phenomenal people that I have with me. Um, cutting to the chase, I'm quickly going to ask you guys about uh, whether communications can really truly transform businesses and chart new courses for organizations and anecdotes and examples that you can share with us in this context. 
we let the man go first guys before i start let's give a big round of applause to alex i think he deserves the stuff to get us all together and you can courier the check to my residence okay i mean he asked me to do it so <laughs> just kidding <laughs> well done well done alex <laughs> awesome <clears throat> i was trying to be an influencer for him uh, but well done alex all right to uh, to your question in terms of uh, how uh, communications can actually shape or transform organizations right uh yes of course they can i mean i agree and i i have i've been part of uh, campaigns which have actually uh, now become new business lines within the organization so let me give you a background since you asked me for an anecdotal example uh we at godrej have uh, a product line which is to you know uh, eliminate mosquitoes basically the larger purpose is to eradicate malaria and dengue dengue is a deadly disease in india which is coming up uh, big time and uh, communications as um, you know as a force to reckon with within the organization thrives on creating research based narrative so one of the researchers threw up some data in terms of saying that the dengue mosquito bites only in the morning and this is a global phenomena so if you don't know please note that the dengue mosquito bites only during the daytime it survives only during the daytime doesn't exist in the night so so if that was the situation our normal formats were still working but they were used only in the night when you go to bed how many of you use mosquito repellents at home or is it just an asian indian phenomena <laughs> so so i mean you know people use it uh, when they go to bed but this research showed that uh, the mosquitoes bite you in the morning the dengue specific mosquitoes and when this research insight came in uh, the thought that we had was who are the most vulnerable tg target audience which gets bitten in the morning guess who are the ones kids right kids where are they in the morning they in the schools do you know any school which has mosquito repellent formats no so that was one of the insights which led to a business development in terms of creating formats which could be used in schools which could be used by kids so the patches the roll ons which had to be safe an entire r and d machinery got behind that and today it's a flourishing business in terms of a new format which is specific for the kids and it's a flourishing profitable high uh, you know margin uh, business which is there so i mean that that is one example which came to my mind when it comes to communications and pr actually affecting some kind of organizational strategy of getting into new product development so i think that's my example uh, among so many others We'll switch the focus to you, Rachna. Tell us a little from the GE perspective and what it means to you guys. Is an enabling function. When we say enabling, means we are also called change managers, change drivers. Uh, interesting example. We are completely into B two B, and as most of you would know, GE is into industrial businesses. And this was an interesting example in one of the operation reviews that we had with one of the businesses. The uh you know the leader of the business said that th there is a market which really doesn't need a type of gas turbines that was really being talked about and we as communicators i think the most important part was domain expertise and somebody in the team in my team was like hey you know what i think we should look at that market and we can help you how many communicators actually would stand up and say hey i know this gas ma uh, turbine market and i'm going to work on this so we had designed a social media campaign some something in the lines of revenue marketing and we launched it in that region and it was amazing to see the type of interest people normally would not buy a gas turbine online or they wouldn't even put inquiries but this was an interesting part there was a lot of reaction lot of interest lot of questions on the type of technology and today that market is one of the biggest markets for for the region almost a 1 billion dollar market so it's not that it's completely driven by communications but the ideation the campaign the revenue marketing uh launch i think everything was managed and driven by the brand and communications team so that i would say is an excellent example of understanding the market and going back to the strategy pushing the businesses saying hey let's look at something that maybe there is a gap in so we're talking about good night and mosquito repellents uh, moving to walmart labs uh, again the diversity of people that you deal with are the engineering folk right so can you give us some examples on transformative change either internally or externally that's been triggered by a campaign that was run by you guys absolutely thank you shreya um i work for walmart and it's a fortune 1 500 billion dollar company 
But if you look at the Bangalore ecosystem, we don't have a branding because we don't have stores in India. So it becomes a lot more difficult for us because we hire engineering talent who actually solve complex problems for technology across the globe for Walmart. And uh, coming back to communications, I think uh, from a communications perspective, uh, it becomes even more important for us to storytell. Storytell with a lot of emotions. How do we kind of look at attracting and retaining talent using the digital platform that we have? And one of the examples that I can cite is, um, you know, we work with engineers and uh, really difficult to sometimes understand their emotions. And uh, last year and this year, um, this, is a, this is the month of February, so it's the Valentine month. So what we've done successfully is we run campaigns um, every month, uh, very focused on um, last year we did something like love my job and then we realized that uh, you know love my job is good we're getting a lot of recognition even in the global um, you know target audience but it's more about technology story that we want to tell so we changed the tactic a little bit and we said love for technology so what we do is we uh, go up to uh, these engineers interview them and really tell their stories in our social media platforms. And then we really encourage them to share it. Uh, and that's how we get a lot of shares and likes. And at the same time, people who, are, uh, who, who aim to work for Walmart actually look up on the social media channel, so it just gets, you know. So there's the that. employee story. Um, you said it, you said, you know, we changed the tactic a little bit, and that's exactly what we're speaking about today. How do you actually shift from a tactical a hands-on approach at that point in time to something that's a lot more strategic. So my next question ties into that. I think we'll start with you and then go the reverse way now. How do you take a communication strategy and then translate it into actual compelling tactical plans that help the business take off and not just, you know, be a seat at the table, but be a voice at the table, as you were saying. So how do you do that? Sure. Um, we all know that, hey, how do we look at strategy? It's the framework. It's how we align to the local business unit. And then we look at the same strategy on how it's actually aligned globally. Uh, we work on strategies every year. And over a period of time now, uh, strategies have become a lot more quarterly focused. And I'm sure you all will agree with me that long-term plans are really not working out for us because business is changing so quick and so fast. And I'm going to be brutally honest in my answer here is one, once the strategy is ready, uh, I actually look at it and I say, hey, this is really good for the organization. But is this going to make people look good? So if I were to present to HR, because they're my very, very important partners, how is it going to make them look good? And then I look at you know, thought leaders, like the engineering leaders, and I take a step back and I say, how does this strategy look good for them? Um, so it's basically, I take a call on how do I present the strategy. Sometimes I present the strategy very holistic. Sometimes I go on very, very tactical when I present especially to the engineering talent saying that, hey, this is what good looks like. And this strategy is going to help us to attract and retain talent. So I, I, I simply look at that. So it's basically playing to the specific gallery that you're speaking to and speaking to them and their voices. So how about you? What do you have to say when it comes to actually taking the strategy and translating it into a powerful, compelling, tactical plan? So strategy is all about making choices. And uh, the way we look at it, we, being a conglomerate, we have a couple of businesses. So I spend a lot of time with each business CEO of the region to understand the business and the business problems. Once we understand the blueprint of the business, then we pick up the problem areas or the gaps or issues that they want us to help them with. So it starts with a conversation. It starts with understanding the business. It starts with their expected outcomes. And then we work backwards. Normally, it is a, an annual process. But as uh, you know, uh, Sunita said, we do look at, relook actually, every quarter. And at times, we relook even monthly whether that's working, and then we measure. We uh, recalibrate depending on the outcomes and the measurements that we use. Are we in the right direction? If not, we pivot. Right. So again, uh, from a multi-business perspective, I'll come to you and ask you the same question and your thoughts on how do you convert a strategy into proper working tactical every day? Well, that's a brilliant question, and I tend to agree with uh, what Rachna just spoke about. 
Uh, so the way we look at strategy at Godridge is at, at various levels. So we have two two acronyms, two terms that we uh, you know haggle with. One is called the LRP, which is called the Long Range Plan, which is a visualization of the function and the impacts that it can create over a period of three to five years. That's the Long Range Plan, which is a visualization. And then we have the AOPs, which is the Annual Operating Plan. So the so the strategy construct is basically five levels. The first level is basically the input seeking, as she rightly said, sitting with individual businesses. So we have about 22 businesses and 46 brands. So this is the month when it happens. So each and every business head comes with the sits with the communication head, laying out their strategic priorities for the year. And this whole cauldron of information is then analyzed, and that's the first bucket. The second bucket is basically what has gone right in the previous years. What is the continuity factor? What are the measures in terms of uh, uh, you know the qualitative and the quantitative measures that we need to up in the coming year. That's the second bucket. The third is the national narratives which are happening, which has a, which have a direct impact on the reputation of the organization. That's the third bucket which is considered. And the fourth one is the latest trends in communications in terms of what all new assault weapons we can get in in terms of social media or digital PR or maybe influencer engagement or own media property. So, so the four four buckets is the time when we spend the maximum amount of brain. Uh, Prime, the kind of uh, involvement which happens with the businesses. Once that is sorted, the next step is the second level, which is all about creating those key strategic priorities, because you can't do everything. So five or six of the key strategic priorities are listed out, agreed with the uh, businesses, a return on objectives kind of a thematic is laid out, what are the objectives and how we could support it. The third level, the third layer rather, is called the strategic objective so once the priorities are set based on the business inputs the objectives are set and then the strategic projects are identified that's the fourth layer projects are basically what we need to do for each business what we do we need to do for the corporate brand and all those sorts of activations which go into the projects and the last part is then the staffing who's going to do what and this is summed up with a lot of measures which come in which are qualitative measures and quantitative measures so this becomes a holistic construct of strategy which is laid out in a blueprint it is circulated extensively within the leadership team. So the first tick mark which happens is setting the objectives right. So they know what to expect from us and we know what to expect out of them. And hence, half of the communication, rather the miscommunications are eliminated. So starting of the year, we know exactly what we want to do through the year. And it's all about then course correcting the entire course basis, the qualitative parameters which come up through the media dipsticks, through the tactical measures and stuff. And this whole circle keeps happening at every quarter there are reviews and this 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 gives a complete strategic uh, approach to communications and then outcomes are obviously brilliant because it's all planned in a way that it's agreed with the businesses okay it's good to know that outcomes are brilliant but outcomes are only brilliant when the actual translation happens at the tactical level are the tasks happening as you want them to uh, is the strategy being run at multiple levels and connecting to that question is, how do you actually build then the true value of these strategies? And how do you do that when you're working with a multi-generational workforce? You have the millennials, you have the baby boomers, you have, you have such a diverse segment of people that you're trying to work with. So how do you then use language and communication and ideation and ideology to then appeal to each one of these seg segments? So. Yeah, that's an interesting question, uh, Shreya, because in a, in a conglomerate, and I'm going to speak about a GE, we have very diverse audience in the sense, youngsters for our digital teams, we have uh, healthcare expertise, uh, we have technologists who are hardcore you know, technologists and they're experts in the field, we have sales force, we have you know, functions, so very, very diverse. So what really helps is clarity of strategy. And I think that's where it all starts from. And G is one of the few companies which is extremely open and uh, transparent about its strategy, the way it's taking uh, business and looking at businesses. And I think the cascading of the business strategy is extremely important. That happens at all the business levels, at the regional levels, what it means to the region and how it aligns to the national agenda. It also means that we look at different type of channels. For example, for youngsters, it could be, you know, or millennials, I would say it is more engagement face-to-face -face on social media uh, and ability to be able to answer and take up 
candid feedback. So we have something called Slido for internal communication, where all the questions are anonymously put. So nobody is, uh, you know, we encourage people to write their names, but if they do not want, then you know, any questions can go to Slido, uh, and it is uh, the trending questions that the leader takes up. So you can't really miss a question. So these are type of tools that we use for the millennials and also for others, but again, it depends on the type of uh, business and the type of audience we're targeting. We also do a lot for diversity, uh, whether it's for women or other uh, diverse uh, audience. I think that type of communication is also extremely important because not everything strikes at the same level, right? So that's the channel piece is the second part. The third part is the manager communication, and I think that's extremely critical. How much is each leader engaged with their audience? And that is something where uh, I personally put a lot, lot of effort and time on just counseling and coaching our leaders saying, spend more time. Right now, we're going through a huge transformation in the company, and I can tell you almost every week we have the global CEO coming up and talking to us, connecting with people directly uh, taking up questions on broadcast, and that cascades down at all the business levels, at the regional levels, at functional levels, and I think there is no two, uh, two ways about personal communication. Right. So in that context then, what do you have to say from your perspective of how, how do you transform actual strategy to tactical by bringing all of the multi multi-diverse owners and consumers of this content. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, strategy according to whom, Shreya? So if I'm talking about strategy to my manager, he looks at it with a very different map, map of the world. Then I'm talking to HR, they look at strategy with their lens. And then I look at millennials, and they look at strategy um, very, very differently. Because one, we have attention span issues there. We have instant gratification over there, especially with millennials. So how do you kind of you know, go back to them and say, hey, these are the four priorities that we are running behind as an organization. They don't understand jargons. So it is really about simplifying things when you're talking to millennials. And it's also um, very, very important to them about what's in it for them. And this is a small crisis situation which happened at Walmart Labs, and I would love to talk about uh, this. Um, so we had a manager who sent out a new joinee announcement. And uh, the new joinee announcement was a cut and paste of uh, another announcement which we went out a while ago. And I know my panelists are smiling because they know about it. And uh, what actually happened was the manager, instead of saying his wife, he, like the new joinee lives in Bangalore with his wife, he cut and pasted something which said, he li the new joinee lives in Bangalore with my wife. And, you know, it's millennials and, and, you know, we kind of researched and found out who that person is, but we didn't take any action on them. Is because the millennials don't understand that, hey, what's the organization that they're working for? What are the value system? You know, what are the ethics? Where does compliance come from? Which just actually happened out of humor. And I spent like two sleepless nights to figure out how to deal with this. And it was very nice to see how a millennial had actually played a prank and I looked at how uh, you know the entire leadership team in Walmart labs actually took a decision and said hey it's okay mistake happens so which was fantastic to actually look at the whole perspective of how people look at things differently and coming back to Rachna's point on diversity uh, today's millennial look at diversity very very openly so we as an organization need to kind of provide that platform for them to really speak up and stand for something that they believe in, and that's where the trust in the organization actually comes for them. Okay, so Sujit. So uh, you're talking about the implementation of the strategy. So I think it's part of the overall strategy document in terms of what are the outcomes. So the focus is on achieving those outcomes, and the outcomes drive uh, what are the kind of modes of communications based on the segment of audience which is there. So it's already mapped through the strategy document. So say, for example, uh, we do a research in terms of uh, diverse audiences, what are their consumption patterns, what are the most effective modes of communications which actually reach out to them and there's an impact. There's a CEI score, this communication effectiveness index score which comes up for each mode of communication. So say for example, it's Facebook at work for the young youngsters. Uh, not many senior people uh, get onto it. If it's about uh, internal events, then it's for the middle management who love to do, uh, you know, participative uh, uh, 
uh, or, or, or love to have a participative approach towards uh, adding value to the organization. So there are various modes of communications which are there with their individual uh, outcomes which are uh, you know, pre-decided and the whole objective of implementation is to achieve those objectives. So it becomes kind of tactical but with the base of having a message, with the outcomes, with the direct connect with what the business can get impacted upon because there's a, there's a cascade effect for those five layers which I explained. The, the strategy bucket, the objective, the projects, the staffing, the outcomes. So it just cascades back and everything has a linkage with the overall uh, group strategy and it, it, it then uh, becomes easy for us to measure also. Uh, measurement is the next question actually. I am going to ask you guys how do you navigate then this world of influence, data, analytics, AI, ROI. There's so many of these terms that hit you on an everyday basis. What is a simple way to navigate through this? Is there a simple way at all or is it? So this is the last question. I'll start with you and then I'll hand it over. So first thing is, you know, I don't believe in ROI. I mean, that must be a statement for most of you because ROI is something which we've grown up with. I know, what's the ROI? ROI is a technical financial term which means whatever communications you do, it should return money easy, which is factually incorrect in the paradigms of communications. So the better way of actually measuring your outputs is ROO, which is return on objectives. If the objectives are created in linkages with the businesses and they're agreed upon, then it's, it's easier to measure, it's easier to report back. Because let me ask you a question, if a crisis happens in an organization, can you, can, the communication team goes and mitigates the whole crisis, can you attach a value to it? Can you say there's an ROI for that? Does that mean the effort has gone based? But if it's an ROO, that the objective was to have the most positive, best brand reputation externally, you can measure it. You can have brand scores, you, have, you can have brand tracks, it's easier to measure, fathom and convince your people. But first basis having the expectation set right. So we've moved from ROI to RO. Another classic example is in the PR parallax we used to use a, a silly term called AVEs, ad value equivalence. Whatever comes in the media, you convert it as per the ad equivalent rate and then report millions of dollars of ROI from PR. Does it make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. So best way is to move from ROI to RO. I think that's worked for us for the past three years and we've moved significantly from that whole concept of ROI to RO. Having said that, the kind of measures which are there, it's a combination of qualitative and quantitative measures. So qualitative measures in terms of PR are your uh, column centimeters, the tonality and all those things. These, are, these, these, these measures are good course correctors. As you move on through the strategy through the year, you know in which direction you're going. But the larger outcomes are increase in the brand scores vis-a-vis -vis your competition. It may be footfalls for our retail business. It could be increase in employee engagement. So these tangible benefits which are agreed upon by the management as well as the comms team are more realistic, more easy to understand, are more impactful. So I think one message that I would like to leave behind us moving away from ROI to ROO actually enhances the respect for the communications function. One, it makes it easier for us to communicate well in the boardrooms also because the larger objectives are met rather than just talking about excitement, two, three awards, a lot of fun during events. I mean, those are stupid, uh, uh, you know, uh, ways of just giving yourself a self-gratification that the event was good. What did it actually achieve? If the outcome was not known, how do you measure it? So I think moving from ROI to ROO is something which is what we're pushing for. Right. So speaking about ROO, what are your thoughts on measurement overall? And you guys use a lot of tools in AI, you were saying, so. So for me, I, I believe in be data informed, not data driven. Because the moment you get into too much of data, then it's very, very difficult to quantify the type of work we do. And uh, I would just give a few examples, uh, adding on to Sujit's points. We do a lot of opinion surveys internally which means we're very clear with what is the expected outcome, and then we work backwards saying, okay, to be able to achieve this behavioral change amongst our employees, this is what we will do. And we plan a couple of things and then go back and check with an opinion survey. So these are the type of data that we would really be interested, in, and these also become KRAs for our business leaders. So that's the type of data we would prefer to work on. Second is integrity, uh, you know, data scores. And these are things that is non-negotiable in a company like GE. So these are things that we would like to really put our efforts on. 
The third thing is, and giving an example, we had a crisis. Uh, it, it's one of the biggest local projects, a diesel local project that we were building, and um, we are building in, in India. And somehow there was a you know, reaction from the political circle saying, this project will be called off. So now this was a big, big thing for us. And we had to, as a communications team, we couldn't really wait and measure and see what's happening. But we could see the tonality moving towards negative, right? That's a good enough indication to pivot and start working into a, uh, in, a, in a strategy, to a strategy which will pull back the project in place. So these are th times where we use data. And I would say data helps us to pivot, to redefine our strategy, to check whether we are on the right track, and to see whether we're getting the desired outcomes. But not really, I wouldn't say we should not get driven or get too much bothered with data because there's just too much happening. And being from an engineering company, all my leaders are just crazy about numbers, crazy about you know data. I think we as communicators, our facilitators, and get them out from there and say, hey, there's something called a human side. There's something called a human uh, storytelling, social impact. And I think that's where the role of communication comes in. Great. And Sunita? Yeah, so ROI, ROO, you know, for a technology company like Walmart, uh, you know, we use so many tools, surveys and things like that. Uh, but there's a fundamental question that I ask myself and I ask my leader too, is what's the trade-off if I don't measure this? Yeah, can we stay without doing what we are doing? We do communication for hygiene. Do we do communication to storytell? How do we measure all this? Like we haven't figured this out, especially for internal communications. Digital is still better. Uh, then I question the amount which is going to be spent on um, measurement for internal communications. And my heart bleeds. I'm like, I'm not going to spend that much money for it. So um, it's really about the trade-off. And he hasn't found the answer, so I haven't found the answer myself. OK, so with that, we're going to come to the last round of this panel. And this is a rapid fire round. So these guys don't know the questions I'm going to be asking them. Um, we'll again start with the man. I think it's time to do away with ladies first. I'm going to actually ask for the mic. So I'm going to ask you just five questions, one word or one phrase, and that's it. The communicator who inspires you the most? Uh, my gun Check. is not firing, sir. <laughs> the communicator who inspires you the most? I, I think our chairman, Mr. Adi Godridge. Okay. Your favorite global communications campaign? Uh, the campaign by Wix PNG, which uh, uh, used diversity, and uh, that one, the third... Uh, best campaign in the world by Holmes Report. And uh, I'm really proud to say that our campaign won the seventh best campaign, and that's my second best. Okay, so that was going to be my next question, your favorite uh, Indian comms campaign that's closest so the, to your heart. While, while, when the jailbirds sang, I think you can Google it off, and it was one of the best campaigns about creating in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, awareness around safety. India is a country with, where safety is you know, treated at the third level. I mean... Uh, it's, it's a fact. I mean, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that, but it's a fact of life that safety is not given that kind of priority. This campaign actually aimed at uh, creating awareness around safety, and the metrics were huge. The kind of behavioral changes which happened, which were measured over a period of two years, were significant, and I think that's my second. Not a rapid-fire answer, but I'll give it to you. What's your one takeaway from the Amina Com conference? Uh, new connections, new friends. I think I met about, made about 25 new friends. Uh, without even exchanging cards. It's a digital world, so LinkedIn and Facebook and <laughs> just shaking hands, and I think I'm going to take those memories back, so. Uh, what is the one trait that's a must-have for a communicator? What's one? Trait that's a must-have for a communicator. Uh, I think it's about connecting with people. Uh, the first trait is that it's a people's business, so you need to be able to communicate with people, connect with people, empathize with people, party with people, and all those things. And the one thing to shift from tactical to strategic? Uh, I think uh, enhancing your business knowledge. Okay. So we shift the lens now quickly, Sunita. <clears throat> the communicator who inspires you the most. It is the same questions. You, have you watched Coffee with Karan? It's the same questions. Uh, Tony Robbins. Okay. Uh, your favorite global comms campaign? Um, 
Uh, so there's this new Walmart ad, and I'm totally in love with it. So that's really nice. It's about cars, and they actually so show Mr. Sam Walton's car in the last. Okay. And uh, your favorite Indian comms campaign? In oh, Swiggy. Terms. I love Swiggy's campaigns. Okay. It's actually a food delivery app, and every week or so they have different campaigns, and they're awesome. Okay. One takeaway from the Amnacom conference. Oh my God, knowing all of you here, I think the networking. Alex, where are you? I'm, I'm like so proud of the work that you do. So yeah, knowing him too. Um, one trait that's a must have for a communicator. I agree with uh, Sujit on this, it's empathy. Okay, and uh, one thing to shift from tactical to strategic. What's in it for me? Okay, Rachna, your turn. The communicator who inspires you the most? Beth Comstock. Your favorite global comms campaign? Dow. Your favorite Indian comms campaign? I always love the simple Tata ad we also make. Okay. That's, yeah, very old, but I love that. Yes. Uh, your one takeaway from the conference? Uh, I love the place, Bahrain, the food, and great people. Okay. For a communicator? Humility. The one thing to shift from tactical to strategic? Domain knowledge. Hey, with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's a... Yeah. yeah, so we have time for two questions. Um, and Mark's already raised his hand before we set the question. Thank you. Super job. Um, Indian organizations tend to be very hierarchical and many layered. Uh, decision making tends to be convoluted and complex. And I think that tends to hamper the desire of communicators to respond quickly and to be agile. How do you manage that tension in your organization? Indian organizations, so I think, um, take a stab at it. You, you wanna? So that that, that's, that's like a rag for me, you know, I'm the only Indian company here. All right, so Mark, uh, the good news is changing. I mean, it's not, it's not, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, let me tell you, I and Mark worked uh, for almost five years uh, together on my, during my Tata days. And I think uh, I agree the element of hierarchy was there, kind of uh, pace was not that high. But today, uh, I think that's all changing with the advent of social media, with the advent of technology. I think, uh, you know, uh, the pace is quite high. The importance of communications has been realized by a lot of organizations. It is being seen today as more of a strategic enabler, as you very rightly said, and as a partner in business rather than just another event manager. Uh, I think these are the factors which uh, enable, uh, you know, faster decision making because the impacts are, uh, you know, if you want to take out an ad or a message, you can't wait for it to get approved for 10 people and wait for three months by the time the essence is lost. So I think that, that importance has dawned on the management and I think the times are changing. But having said that, it still exists in many organizations. Uh, it's about uh, uh, the responsibilities with the communicators themselves to navigate through these things. Uh, by one of the things which the young lady before us spoke about learning to say no. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we as communicators in today morning during breakfast, we were discussing the same thing, that just too many things which come across and we say yes to everything and then that whole clutter lose on the priorities and that actually delays the whole decision making. So I think that's one more uh, critical thing for a communicator to learn to say no. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, delays happen because lack of domain knowledge, which she spoke about, I think, Today's need of the communicators to master the business, get the domain knowledge right, so that he or she can then take decisions on the foot. So I think there are things which are uh, changing for the good, and I hope they continue to change. Does that answer your question up to a certain level? Okay, so we had time only for one question. Quickly wrapping this up in the form of, can, do we have time for one more? No. So, so offline, we'll catch you off stage. Okay, quick question, quick answer. Uh, we have pro an issue with metrics all the time because I'm working for clients and they wanted. I was interested where you said about footfall, about how you can assign or attribute footfall, an increase in footfall, a kind of qualitative measure, no, qualitative measure. But how do you really, ha do they agree to that? How do you make it a percentage? What do you, how do you quantify it? It's, it's pretty simple, actually. Say, for example, we run a retail business, one of the biggest retail uh, gourmet food retail store in the country called Gourmet Nature's Basket. 
And uh, I think one of the tasks for community, it's a brand build on PR, first thing. Uh, one of the best campaigns that we did for that was uh, about creating that whole transition from gourmet food to healthy food, right? And in that whole messaging, uh, we brought in the importance of health foods, green vegetables, fresh bread, and all those things. So that's the messaging part of it. But when the messaging was being transferred to the audiences, the mode of communication were multiple. There was a Facebook, there was a, a Twitter uh, campaign, there was a mailer campaign, there's a couponing activity. Everything had a kind of a call to action. So if you read that ad and come down to the store and buy, you were given a specific code. That makes me confident that this person has come because of the code, because she's availing that discount or whatever gratification. And if that number is high, it's a direct proof saying that the footfall has gone up because of this particular campaign. So there are three ways in which footfall happens. One is the regular customers who any which way has come in, the, the loyalists. The second one are the impulse buyers who pass by and they see a nice, beautiful store, they walk in. But this is driven, the third one is driven by the campaigns. And that's easy to measure because there's a call to action element in the communication. And that gives us... And, and, the, and the results were high because 25% of the footfalls for that particular month came through the couponing activity. And then the learnings are that this mode delivered about 20% of that 25%, 80% came through coupons, some came from Twitter activity. So which mode to be emphasized on where the money has to be put in and month on month when the measure happens, we can track every month that the footfall is increasing and this is because of this particular mode of communication. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. okay, with that, it's a wrap. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for staying on and listening to us. It should actually be Tika after last night. <laughs>